Welcome, everyone. My name is Kurt Strong, and I'm one of the elders here at uh, Faith Community. And uh, it's my opportunity to share with you today uh, from Galatians chapter 5, a message that's dear to my heart, the spirit-controlled life. I told my wife um, as I was preparing the message, and uh, it just seemed like this is the message God wanted me to, to speak today. And and uh, prepare for, and I just shared with her, I, I think this is the most important message I have ever preached. And she said, um, you say that a lot. <laughs> and, and I'd have. I, I've you know, thought other messages. It, it's interesting when you're preparing a message, especially something that's really important to you. Uh, it impacts you. I mean, I literally sweat. <laughs> and I don't sweat easy, but I, when I'm preparing a message, and one like this, uh, it happens uh, because it's so dear and it's God ministering to you and I hope it minister, he ministers to you too as I share it with you. I want to ask you a very important question. Are you happy with your Christian life? Many, many Christians are not. They're some of the saddest people sometimes. You say, well, you, you don't know some of the circumstances that they're facing. Well, that, that's true. But uh, that doesn't mean you need to not... Uh, be happy with your Christian life. Um, and I want to share with you how to do that, how to be happy with your Christian life, because that's what God wants you to, to be. God wants you to be happy. And that's why one of the special verses that are in the Bible that I like, it's really easy to memorize, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, just say it twice, okay? Uh, but that's really powerful. When God says to do something twice, he wants you to catch it. It's like something, I don't want you to miss this. I want you to catch this. I want you to rejoice in your life. I want you to rejoice in the Lord with your life. I want him uh, to be magnified in your life that was just uh, presented. And, and, I, and I want you to feel like he's present there with you. And so God wants you to be happy. God wants you to rejoice. And really, this is how I measure my Christian life. Um, when I'm you know, going through bad thoughts or circumstances uh, and, you know, maybe focused on uh, something that really isn't good, uh, then I, I just, that's a sign. That's not where God wants me to be. God, help me. Help me to get out of that. Help me not to think that way. Help me to think right. And so when you're thinking right and you're right spiritually, you will rejoice. And that's how to be happy in the Lord and uh, live under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to talk to you today. Paul, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians in the Bible, described the spirit control life this way. I am crucified with Christ. What does that mean? I'm dead. I'm dead. Uh, I died with him. And the day when I got saved, I died with him. When you get baptized, uh, it's a representation of his death as you stand in the water. And that's what the way he wants you to think. I am crucified with Christ. It's nevertheless, I live, I'm alive, yet not I. It's not me that you see. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want Christ to be seen in me. And I know that's not an easy task, but that's what the spirit control life is all about. And that's the way I said that I strive to live. And it makes me very happy. In all my circumstances, I'm not always happy with my circumstances. But I am happy the Lord's there with me, helping me to deal with those circumstances in the way that he wants me to deal with them. And he's my strength. And he's my message. And that's what God wants us to have. In Galatians chapter 5, this spirit control life is mentioned and described. And I want to share from verse 13 on. And uh, I want you just to think about all the uh, things that Paul uh, shares here. For you are called to freedom. Think about this for your Christian life, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement you shall love. There's the key word, your neighbor as yourself. Just stop and think about that. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. 
For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who are belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I do pray that you'd help us to see ourselves through your eyes, in perfections and all, to see what we really are like. And how much we need you. And Lord, help us to see the way you want us to live. Help us to focus on being what you want us to be. And Lord, help us to delight in you so that you can delight in us. Do you desire that for Christ to be desired, delighted, I should say, in you? He wants to be. And so I just encourage you to think about that and consider this thought. Are you living for you or are you living for God? Because that's really where it wraps up. Uh, in the spirit control life, you're living for God. You're not living for you. It's a different attitude than the, Christ, the, the uh, Christian who's backslidden and the Christian that's not uh, really trying to live for God. Um, you need to have your life focused on him to do this. So the spirit control life lives in freedom, according to the scripture here in James, excuse me, Galatians chapter five, uh, and uh, the freedom is something that you ought to like. And our country is—I love our country because it, freedom is what God wants us to have, and freedom is what we can have. But freedom comes through loving others, and uh, that's sometimes different than what uh, uh, people understand it to be. You see, uh, I can remember uh, listening uh, on the radio. Uh, and I was driving and uh, uh, Christian radio, and the speaker was from the Near East, and uh, he's from a very you know, controlled totalitarian government regime, and he'd come to America. And uh, he was just sharing in that broadcast uh, his shock when he came to this country at what he found. He said, I, I thought when I would come to America, I would find people that would just love freedom. But he says, I've come to America and I've found people that they don't even understand freedom. Uh, they, they don't live free at all. They're in bondage. They, they live lives that are destroyed. And he says, it really disheartened me. Here I am from a third world country and I know more about freedom than what many Americans live and enjoy and don't do. Freedom comes through loving others. And that's the way God wants us to live, and he wants us to have it. it freedom isn't license to sin. Um, that's why in, in uh, verse uh, um, 10, uh, excuse me, uh, 13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Uh, that's freedom. Uh, learn to enjoy freedom. Uh, but it doesn't come from you enjoying you. It comes from you enjoying other people. That's how you find freedom. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, and that's that word love. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that only happens when you love Christ first and foremost. And then it says, for the whole law is fulfilled in that one word, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed, uh, um, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Your life is going to be miserable. You're going to get what you give. If you give love, you'll get love. But if you live in misery and treat people miserable, miserably, 
that's what you're going to get as well. Freedom isn't a license to sin. Uh, it's not a license to do whatever you want. And he says, that's what I see in America. That's what I see in America. And when I was listening to that broadcast, and I can see why he said that. Many people think freedom is just doing whatever you want. You're going to find in the Bible it says that's not at all it. Uh, that's self-worship. That's worshiping you. It's the exact opposite. If you want to know what the, the lost life is, it's living as though I'm God uh, and worshiping self. That's what the lost life is like. And if you live that way as a Christian, self-worship, you're falling for the same line that, that the lost have found. Uh, this is why we see so many Christians, or I really say people, living in bondage. Bondage to drugs, bondage to all kinds of sin, and living in depression. Uh, more today than ever. Here we got so much, you know, always startled me, uh, surprised me, I should say, that um, so many inventions. You got the internet, and you know, so many things in there, you know, talking about uh, all the new things that they're going to be able to uh, do with uh, intelligence, you know, and, and uh, we got this tremendous life and tremendous opportunities, and people are so depressed, so depressed, and they're not happy, and they're miserable, and they're taking drugs, they're, they're doing all kinds of things, committed suicide. It's, it's worse than ever in, in young people. What's wrong? Something's wrong. I think the speaker from um, the third world country was right. The totalitarian regime helped him to see what real freedom is. It's not doing whatever you want. Freedom comes by giving ourselves to God to love others. That's what freedom is. God order is totally different than the lost life. God's order, well, the lost life order, self first. Maybe others, and God's not even in the picture. But in the Christian life, it's supposed to be God first, Others second, and then self last. And you say, well, who's going to take care of me? God will. And you'll be a far better person for it. Freedom comes from God. Bondage comes from Satan. But it also comes from the flesh. It comes from you. Your worst enemy is you. You need to see it. The flesh is your enemy. Your selfish desires are your enemies. Second, the spirit-controlled life walks in the spirit according to the Scripture. It's seeking the Holy Spirit's leading as you go through life. Walking, what does that mean? Going through life. As you go through life, you're, you're, you're dealing with life, you're dealing with your family, you're dealing with work, you're dealing with your friendships. You do it the way God wants you to do it. You, you consider what is God's will, and that's what you strive to do. It's living according to God's will. And in verse 16, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desires of your flesh. For the flesh such its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. Your, yourself, your selfish motives, your selfish desires, the old you, the old nature, the sinful nature that you still have, that's your enemy. And it's also God's enemy. So that you may not do the things that you please. That's what he was saying. It, freedom isn't doing what you want. You, if you do what you want, you'll mess up your life. Uh, you'll do the things that are worse for you rather than better for you. Well, let's take a look at how one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, I think it's my favorite character in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. I mean, I just admire him. You know, um, he lived a, <laughs> so wicked in the sense that he, he tried to live for God, but he put Christians in jail and he persecuted Christians he, and he even sought to go into other areas to persecute them when they were long distances away from Jerusalem. And he had this passion. He, he saw Christians as the enemy. But then he met the Holy Spirit and he met Jesus Christ in that road to Damascus. And his life was changed. And God changed him and he became, uh, just like he was so burdened to, to destroy Christianity, he became burdened to spread Christianity. Changed the world. Turned the world upside down as many of the people described his ministry. In Romans chapter 7, Paul gives his view of being controlled by the Spirit. And I want to share this with you uh, because this passage has so much significance for me. Uh, I can remember I was saved when I was 23. And when I was 23, I'd made a profession when I was younger, but I didn't understand it at all. I didn't repent of my sin. I just lived in sin. And uh, I was very unhappy. And um, when uh, 
uh, I got saved, genuinely saved, and I repented of my sins and asked Jesus to take over and control my life. As I was 23, it became such a battle. I'd live in so much sin, I, I, cussing all the time. I, uh, I had all, you know, the thoughts just in my mind were wrong, and, and I, I, I didn't uh, appreciate people. I wasn't always good to people. I was mean sometimes, and, and I, you know, just had a miserable life. And now I get saved, and, and now I got this battle to overcome all this stuff that was wrong. I wanted to stop those things that I knew were wrong. I, wanted to, I didn't want to hurt Christ anymore. I wanted to honor him. I wanted to live for him. And that was the desire. But man, I, I was struggling. I, I, I'd, uh, with the truth, you know, I, I'd, I'd be uh, talking with someone and I, I'd say, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what I said was wrong. It's not true. Here's what really, I just had to catch myself like that. I just was so prone to sin and bad words, how they just flowed out of my mouth. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said it. And I mean it. I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me. And so it was a battle. It was a real war going on inside of me. But then I went away to, well, when I was 26, God called me to become a pastor. <laughs> Someone that, should, in my view, never been thought to be a preacher, never thought of it a day in my life. And all of a sudden, three years after I get saved, God calls me to be a pastor. And I'm just, wow. I just, but I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to be a pastor. That's what I wanted to be because I just felt called. And I went in and I shared that with my wife, and she was okay with it. And, and, uh, but then I, I thought about it. How are people going to be receptive of me? You know, my, my life has not been at all good. And then God calls me to go to Freeport, where I am from. To, and I committed all this sin in Freeport. And I knocked on doors, and people that I would see, you know, would be people that, you're a pastor? What happened? Uh, you know, so I just really struggled with that. Um, and then I, I went to seminary. And when I was at seminary, I took a, a course in Romans. And uh, I had all this struggle going on inside of me. And uh, when I went to uh, that class in Romans, we studied verse by verse all the way through the book of Romans. And we came to Romans 7. And this is written by Paul, the same author from Galatians. He wrote more books of the New Testament than any other author. And uh, he was the greatest Christian in my mind, I told you. And here's what he said about his Christian life. He says in verse 18, Romans 7, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Nothing. You see all the you know, people that are trying to pretend like they're good? He says, I know I'm not good. That is in my flesh, for the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. I want to do good, but I just don't do it. In verse 19, for the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. In other words, he says, I feel like a hypocrite. Uh, sin takes control. I want to do right, but I mess it up. Verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is pre present in me, the one who wishes to do good. I struggle with evil, Paul says. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, the new spirit man, but I, that the law is right, God's right, righteousness is the right thing to do. But I see a different law in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Two laws going on. The law of God, the law of my mind, will, and emotions, and that's the spirit uh, working in his life. And when you get the spirit in your life, uh, that takes uh, control of you and helps you to change. But then he says, I got this law of sin that's still there. The wretched man that he was. And that's why he said in verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am. The, the greatest Christian calling himself wicked. And he says, who will set me free from the body of this death? And then he gives the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then on one hand, I myself 
with my mind, am serving the law of God, but in the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. The new nature in him is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And he says, God puts the right thoughts up there, and, and he gives me the desire to do those right thoughts, and he gives me the right emotions, but I gotta fight my old nature, I gotta fight my flesh, because it's there to defeat me from doing those things. This is the spiritual battle every believer faces every day of your life. I don't know if you looked at your life like this, but that's what Paul says he experienced, and that's what we all experience. It's a battle. It's a battle against who you are in the flesh, and it doesn't stop just because you got saved. It's still there. The desires are, are still there. And Paul says, you got to battle. you got to do war. I met a prisoner in jail uh, who came to our RU meeting. Uh, I used to, uh, when we had RU at our church, we had it for several years, and it was one of the greatest ministries they had. And, and um, we'd go into the jail. I'd go in every Tuesday. And, and uh, when I'd preach, um, and we'd have RU in jail, because we had it at our church too. Inmates can't go to <laughs> church, though, you know, and so go to the jail. And uh, uh, we, I'd preach uh, for a while, and then uh, afterwards we'd uh, have a, a, one of the cafeteria tables um, set up, and we'd have RU and all the guys that wanted to come over and, and be involved in RU and learn how to deal with their life and find victory in Christ. And, and uh, they would come, and they'd sit around that table, and, and then I would sit down, and we'd uh, talk. And uh, a new guy was there, and uh, uh, he uh, shared... Uh, his life. It just all of a sudden, you know, every person could talk and share whenever they wanted to, and he just said this, something like this. He says, I'm a good man. I really am. But he says, I'm here because I beat up my wife. I, I'm not sure his wife, girlfriend. And she testified against me. He was like resentful of that. But I'm a good man. That's what he said. And I thought about that a moment, and then I told him, I'm a bad man who needs to be under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ or I do a lot of bad stuff. I need him to be in control of me and he helps me to do good. I tried to convey to that fellow the Christian life. But you know, that's the way a lot of people look at life. You're not necessarily beating up your girlfriend, but you think you're good. You think what you do is good enough. God says, that's not it at all. That's not the Christian life that God wants for you. He wants you to be spirit-controlled. He wants you to be under his control. In Galatians chapter 5, in verse 18, he says, for I know, as Paul again talking, uh, excuse me, I, I got to get back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What does that mean? You don't need the law. You don't need the Ten Commandments to tell you what's right and what's wrong. you got the Holy Spirit inside you. And he tells you, of course, you got your conscience too. Uh, the law is not my guide when I'm a Christian. The Holy Spirit is. He leads me. He, he, he deals with me when I'm messing up. He deals with me when I have wrong thoughts. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, and then he gives a list of them, immorality, impurity, sensuality. Oh, that, that involves pornography that involves you know marriage excuse me sex out of marriage and adultery it involves premarital sex it involves all that stuff and uh, just thinking uh, when you see a, a woman that's you know you're attracted to and thinking ugly thoughts he says that is sin that's horrible that's that's bad that's the deeds of the flesh and then he talked about idolatry that's self worship and sorcery, that's dealing with drugs or, or false doctrines or false teaching, cults, enmities, uh, strife, not getting along, being mean and arguing, jealousy of what other people have, outbursts of anger. Man, that was the way I was before I was a Christian, and I was struggling with that in my early Christian life. Disputes, dissensions, and factions, envies, drunkenness, carousing, the nightlife, and thinking that that's good. All those things and the things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the Christian or the kingdom of God. That's not what a Christian is. And if you live that way, as a good sign you're not a Christian. Our flesh is our enemy. You've got to see that. If you're going to live under the spirit 
Spirit-controlled life, you got to see you as the enemy. Our flesh is wicked, so never defend it. When you find yourself saying something bad, don't defend it and say, excuse me. Uh, say, man, I'm sorry. Or when you uh, say something um, you know, that's not quite true, stop. Correct it. Uh, or when you uh, get upset at someone and you're not being kind, stop. I'm sorry. Correct it. Uh, You've you got to not allow Satan to have power over you. See, our flesh puts us in bondage to Satan. We can't let that happen. We've got to do battle with it. Satan lures us into sin, and we just follow if we don't. Thus, we do battle. Our, fla- our flesh never dies until we die. So if you're here today, I'm 74. You might be a little older than me. You say, well, maybe when I get to be saved a little longer, I won't have a struggle like this. <laughs> You're never going to get over your struggles. You're always going to struggle with these things. Not quite maybe the degree that you did before, but you're always going to struggle with messing up with your Christian life. Our flesh needs to be opposed and overcome. you got to oppose it. you got to do battle with it. If we're going to be the spirit-controlled believers that we want to be, and I want to be that. I, I want to do what's good. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. And then third... The spirit-controlled life becomes like Christ. That's really what the spirit-controlled life is. And that's really what God is trying to do in every believer. He's trying to make you like Christ. You say, what do you mean? Well, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the character of Christ. Take a look at it in verse 22 of Galatians 5. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's agape love. That's God's love. That's what Jesus had for you. That's why he died on the cross. He wants you to have that love. Joy. Remember that joy we talked about rejoicing the Lord always? He wants you to be filled with joy. He wants you to have a life of joy. Peace. He wants you to be right with God all the time. He doesn't want you just to be right with God on occasion when you come to church, whatever. Patience. That's a struggle, isn't it? Patience. I don't care what you're doing. If you're trying to rush and and, uh, you're going to do it wrong, you need to be patient. God gives you that patience, kindness. I want to have that. I want to be gracious with people. Goodness. I want to strive to do the right thing. That's what he says, uh, I'll give you. And then faithfulness, consistency. You know, I, I want to be good at everything I do. And, and I found that if you don't work at it, you can't be good at it. Gentleness. That means meekness, humility. That is a hard one to grab a hold of. But God wants to give it to you. You know who one of the meekest person to ever live is? Jesus. He had these fruits. Self-control. Now that's a, a, a word that is not exactly maybe the best choice in my view. S- self-control implies the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Not for you to be in control. To be spirit control. That's what we're talking about. God to be in control of you. Against such, there is no law. In other words, you don't need the law for these things. Verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. you got to die to you. Just like Paul says, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. i got to die to me. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let him lead you everywhere you go and respond the way he wants you to respond. Let us not be, uh, become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. If you don't live spirit-controlled, this is what you'll do. That's what he's saying. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the character of Christ. Become like Jesus. We can't get the fruit of the Spirit by self-effort. That's why that, you know, uh, self-control, uh, you, you can't get it that way. Uh, You've got to get it from God. Being the best that we can be isn't at all God's desire. And you hear that all the time. You ask a person, how are you doing in your Christian life? Best I can. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to be the best that you can. He wants you to be the best that he can make you. Uh, We can only get the fruit through Christ and the Holy Spirit working in us as we submit to it. Uh, It comes by prayer. And if you're not into prayer, pray about everything. That's the only way you're going to get spirit control of life. You've got to deal with prayer, and you've got to talk with God about the struggles that you're facing and, uh, and the things that you're confused by and, and the difficulties that you're having. And, and then once you know what he wants you to do, you surrender to it. God, help me to do it. Help me to be honoring to you. You must 
die daily to you. That's the spirit control life. You got to do that every day to live for Christ because you'll never do it on your own. Uh, it's listening to your conscience and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and then repenting of your sins as he identifies those sins to you. And you ask the Lord God, to, and maybe you need to apologize to people too. God, take that away. Uh, cleanse my mind. And, and you, you just need to do it all the time. It's constantly seeking the Lord's will in prayer through the issues of life each day, walking with Jesus. That's how you get to become like Jesus. You walk with him. It's seeking the Lord's power in doing his will and praising him through it, that he's doing it. It's not you. You can't take credit for it. You know who you are without him. Give him the glory. I want to close with this invitation thought. God has a wonderful plan for your life, but you have to choose to live it through him and for him. That's what he wants for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we know that you've described in your word a life that is very challenging for everybody here. I don't care how long they've been saved, but God, we also know that you never call us to do something that you don't give us the power to do. And God, as we look at uh, this passage of Scripture and realize the battle that we face, if we're going to be what you want us to be, we've got to die to ourselves, just like Paul did. We need to live for you. We need to allow you to lead us in our life. We need to allow you to uh, help us to see the things that we do not see, that we might honor you and do your will the rest of our lives to be everything that you want us to be. Put that in our heart, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen.